Time. Listen, we're delighted that you're here. This is a part of an ongoing series called Econo uh, Conversations with Economists that the department's been, been running for, uh, for years now. And every few weeks or every couple months, for sure, we have exciting speakers. It's usually uh, someone from outside the uh, department, but often it's uh, a faculty member. Sometimes it's alumni come to speak. We've had presidents of different countries. President of Bolivia has, has come speak, uh, to speak. Uh, so we've had just a range of excellent speakers, pe people that write for the financial press. And uh, I want you to just keep an eye on our website on, on BU Today where we announce this conversation with Economist Series. And, and please do continue to attend. And next time we have Jeff Sachs, we're going to make Sure, we got a 500-person auditorium because uh, obviously you're uh, in high demand. The, uh, at this price. At this price. <laughs> That's right. Good point. All right. I'm not going to. Uh, I don't want to test the market. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time uh, introducing Jeff. He has a. Uh, fabulous new book out. It's appropriate that we're, we're located on Commonwealth Avenue because the title of the book is Commonwealth. If you're interested, you can buy copies outside after the talk or at the BU bookstore. The, uh, the book is really uh, getting at some of the uh, major challenges facing the world and in, uh, in explaining these challenges and proposing solutions in a way that only Jeff Sachs can do. He has a, a brilliant career. He's advised uh, many, many countries around the world. He's done uh, brilliant academic work. He knows uh, essentially every single top leader in the world. And on top of all that, he's a terrific guy. I think in large part to his uh, wonderful wife, Sonia. The last thing I need to say is I need to thank Richard and Amy New, who. Uh, are financing this conversation series. Uh, they, Amy was a graduate uh, a few years back, and Richard was a graduate many years back, her dad. So uh, thanks again for coming. And uh, again, I'm sorry that not all of you can have seats, but uh, let's all listen. Yeah. Yikes. Let's just do it that way. Okay. Wow, thank you. <laughs> thanks, uh, Larry, so much for uh, the invitation. Thanks for all of you. Uh, not only is the title appropriate being Commonwealth, but the subtitle is appropriate. It's called Economics for a Crowded Planet. <laughs> so <clears throat> how much better can it be than that? And Larry uh, said as you were coming in, I don't know if you heard him, he said, uh, come in, crowd in, you may meet someone for life. And it, <clears throat> I whispered to him that, that's how I met my wife. We were standing in line for a very, uh, for a movie freshman year at, uh, at college. So you don't look to the person next to you. Uh, say hello, you never know. Uh, that's uh, my first piece of advice today. I'm so glad uh, that you're here. And I know that you're here because the topic of uh, our crowded planet and trying to find some sensible approaches for the world is on everybody's minds right now. Uh, maybe not everybody's minds, but on every campus. Because I think that the mood of the American campuses is extraordinary. It's extraordinarily exciting. Uh, there's, a, in my opinion, uh, a tremendous, tremendous energy of you uh, to uh, do something better than what's being done right now in the world, which really is in a bit of a mess. And the book is basically arguing that if we continue doing what we're doing, ironically, despite all of the positive things that can be accomplished right now, we will not only uh, fail in so many ways, but we'll actually go right over a cliff. Uh, we're in a lot of trouble in the world, paradoxically, at a time when we have phenomenal capacity not just to 
avoid disaster, but actually to solve a lot of existing problems and improve the quality of life for all parts of the world. And we're not doing that very well right now. In some ways, normal global processes are making some progress, whether it's market forces or the spread of ideas, uh, is leading to some notable improvements in well-being in some major parts of the world. On the other hand, we're operating in such a blind way right now, such a thoughtless manner, especially, unfortunately, our country, the most powerful in the world, uh, has been so blind to both the, what it's doing and what it could be doing that we've spent the last decade and more actually digging ourselves into deeper trouble. And the book is suggesting uh, ways that we could uh, get out of, uh, out, out of uh, harm's way. What is the problem uh, and what, are the, uh, what, are, what is the complex situation that we find ourselves in today? Essentially, the book and my own thinking and my own professional experience is all about the fact of a truly global society emerging before our eyes in the last 30 or 40 years. The phenomenon we summarize as globalization, in my view, is a real phenomenon, a dramatic phenomenon. It offers the possibility of a globally interconnected society with shared prosperity. It also offers the possibility of a wrecked planet if we get it wrong, uh, wrecked by uh, human intention or human lack of intention. It could be through a spread of violence or it could be through our shocking neglect of certain basic physical realities on our planet and the ways that we're doing great damage to the planet. I began my own practical life work uh, in uh, thinking about this when I had the uh, interesting opportunity to begin advising uh, a country in crisis, Bolivia in 1985. I had already um, uh, had studied at, at the uh, feet of uh, Larry Kotlikoff. He was uh, uh, my uh, uh, lead section person in teaching me uh, about economic history. Uh, and uh, I uh, had joined the faculty, and I actually thought I knew a little bit, but it was when I got engaged in, uh, in problem solving in the real world that uh, I took another uh, uh, order of magnitude of, uh, of uh, confusion uh, and uh, realization of how complex things were and how hard it is to uh, understand the phenomena of our world without some kind of engagement. And what I found in this process of engagement was that every part of the world, from Bolivia up in the Andean Mountains to Poland after the fall of uh, the communist era, to uh, India after 1991 with its reforms that ended decades of economic isolation, to, of course, booming China and then in the last dozen years to uh, poverty and disease-ridden Africa, that all parts of the world are interconnected as never before. And from every perspective in the world, individuals, communities, national governments are asking themselves the question, how do we fit in to this fast-changing world? And what are we to make of this interconnectedness? And this has been for me, therefore, roughly a quarter century of thinking about how we can make a global society function adequately. Obviously, when we carry a tremendous amount of baggage of poor understanding, I know my own confusion before I see any place with my own eyes, we carry a tremendous amount of baggage of confusion, lack of empathy, lack of ability to understand others. You look at this room, it's like 
many campuses, I might say, maybe more so in a way, how diverse and how global this community is. And so you will get it. But our societies don't get it very well. And our difficulties of cooperating and understanding what's going on in the heads of others has brought us to war and is bringing us to greater and greater violence. And this, I think, is the ultimate challenge that the book addresses. But it does so from the point of view of an economist trying to solve problems about material life. So the question that I'm constantly asking myself is how can we help to ensure that people meet their material needs, their basic needs in a world where we have riches beyond belief, and we have 10 million children dying each year because they're too poor to stay alive. A very odd paradox. How can we meet material needs when we have mastered technologies so marvelously and at the same time we're destroying the physical systems of the world on which our food supplies depend? Or we're depleting vital resources uh, and think that the solution to that is to go to war to station troops uh, in an oil producing region as opposed to developing alternatives that can be a global generalized solution. And that is the way that I'm trying to understand the globalization challenge is by asking the question, can we achieve a, an approach on a world scale which truly addresses the needs of people in all parts of the world, acknowledges their needs, their wants, and finds a set of institutions, a set of arrangements, a set of intergovernmental agreements, a set of private actions that can make it possible to live harmoniously, to have material objectives fulfilled, and to do it in a way that is environmentally sustainable? It's a big question. Uh, you might say a little bit of hubris to ask the question, but I think it's the question we all have to ask right now. And in my view, we've come to a point in our world society where this has become the central question, in fact. It's not the central question we're asking. It's the central question we ought to be asking. See, even the lights are going out. Uh, interesting. All right. You proved my point. There we go. OK. But there's a better day ahead. Um, this is not choreographed. Uh, so I was quite taken, for example, this weekend when the finance ministers of the world got together in Washington for the annual spring meeting of the International Monetary Fund. And the development ministers right across the street, uh, one is at 18th in Pennsylvania, the other is at 19th in Pennsylvania, they came for the annual meetings of the World Bank. And what did they speak about? They actually came thinking that they were going to talk about voting rights at the IMF or the financial crisis or monetary policy or other things. And those are important, but they actually spent the weekend panicking about the surging food prices in the world and the fact that there are riots just clear across the developing world right now. A tremendous amount of instability as a result of rice, which has doubled in price in the last 12 months, wheat, which has nearly tripled in price, uh, maize or corn, as we call it here, which has uh, more than doubled in price in the last few months. And I was struck by two things which uh, are, uh, for me, quite uh, jarring. One is that uh, they were almost in panic about this. And the second is they knew nothing about it, which is also par for the course these days. Our fields and areas are so disjointed, and the lack of understanding from one place to another of what's actually happening in another part of the world is so disconnected 
that the finance ministers floundered around for a couple of days. We got to do something. But they had not a single constructive idea because they don't know particularly much about food systems or how to grow food or what's actually happening. And so they left saying, we got to do something. Uh, and the way the world works uh, often is that nothing will be done until they next get together and then again say, we got to do something. Uh, and so we actually have to do better than that. What is the problem and challenge? Now, it's obviously a complicated question to talk about the whole world and to summarize it in a way which isn't trivial. But let me try to give some meaningful basic points that I think are starting points for thinking about this challenge of creating sustainable development at a global scale in an interconnected world. The world is crowded. That's, I believe, the starting point. It's crowded in, at, a, at an extent that we can't really yet grasp and uh, understand the implications. Part of the crowding is the number of people. We're 6.7 billion people on the planet. The world's population continues to increase at about 75 to 80 million per year. So the increase remains very rapid. But the 6.7 billion is a lot. We have filled every ecological niche on the planet. The human population has gone up essentially tenfold since the start of the industrial era. It's a massive increase. And it is combined with a massive increase of the amount of economic output or income or almost equivalently use of resources per person on the planet. They're all s somewhat distinct concepts, but they're all closely related. If you try to measure how much the output per person has gone up, we use a measurement called the gross national product for a country or the gross world product if you add across countries. We try to adjust the measurements uh, that countries make so that there's a common base of pricing for the things that are produced or consumed so that they are purchasing power adjusted prices. And when you use the best but highly flawed measures of this, the average income or output per person in the world now is about $10,000 per person. If you look back at the beginning of the industrial age, of course, you can't really make a comparison with now because the way we live, the technologies, everything is different and uh, didn't exist uh, uh, in the year 1800. But if you try to make some very rough calculation, you might say that uh, the income has gone from roughly $500 per person in that kind of metric to about 10,000 now, so maybe a 20-fold increase, combined with roughly a 10-fold increase in the number of people. So the total output of the world has roughly gone up by 200 times since the industrial era began, roughly at the beginning of the 19th century. And my contention is this is the phenomenal fact, the fact of scale change. And we've reached a point where we have to grapple with this directly. This is not a novel observation, but it's one that I'm so struck with uh, in terms of what these magnitudes mean. Of course, in a sense, they mean we're in each other's faces as never before. And it means that we are interconnected as never before. And it means that any two points on the planet have some interrelations now we're a fully connected system, as opposed to just different pieces uh, loosely connected. Places that we think can't have anything to do with us turn out to be of dominant concern suddenly. I often think that if on September 10, 2001, I had been asked what place in the world is least likely to affect us, I might have said, well, it's probably some landlocked region in the, in the middle of the Eurasian landmass, you know, as far away as can be, place like Afghanistan. 
And then, of course, you realize this becomes the consuming focus of interconnection for the next seven years. And it just shows there is no place that isn't interconnected. And every time someone says, but why should we care? Because everything is interconnected and can deeply affect our lives and our livelihoods and our survival going forward. That's how crowded we are and how interconnected. But what we haven't grappled with is really uh, most of the political and social and ecological implications of this. At a political level, there's something, and, or at an economic level, there's something very important happening, which on the whole is quite wonderful. It's what I devoted a lot of my career to help adding a little bit to, and that is the ability of poor countries to catch up technologically with richer countries. We have high living standards in the United States, not because we're so wonderful, as we, uh, our politicians are wont to tell us every day, but because we have a wonderful suite of technologies that have been developed largely over the last couple of centuries that give tremendous productivity to what we do and how we spend our time. And in general, the wonderful thing about technology is that it's available for everybody, not just those who happen to hold it and use it at a given moment, because fundamentally technology is ideas, or as sometimes in economics, uh, given the metaphor, blueprints. It's basically something that is non-rival. It's available for all. And since well-being depends most essentially on technology, the ability of all parts of the world to have a significant increase of well-being over a baseline of subsistence is a truth for the world. And what's happening today, quite wonderfully, is that for a very large part of the world, that ability to catch up technologically is occurring at an unprecedented rate, what economists call convergence, convergent economic growth. It means that even if the rich countries continue to experience economic growth, as is the case on average, even if not in the year 2008, in the recession that we're in, but on average it continues, the poorer countries in general have the ability to grow even faster economically than the rich countries because they can absorb and adopt and adapt technologies that they don't have yet that can give them a propulsive boost to narrow the gaps which are essentially technological gaps. And my view is that we've entered an age that is quite fundamentally marked by convergence. And I think that on the whole, that's a quite wonderful thing, in fact. Interestingly, for the first 150 years or so after the Industrial Revolution began, we were in a process largely of divergence where the rich got richer, and even if the poor got a little bit richer, they were actually getting richer less rapidly than the rich were moving forward. And the reasons, I think, were that at the beginning of the industrial era, the ability to make and use and advance technologies was still restricted to a relatively small part of the world, basically the North Atlantic world. And that region just soared ahead of the rest of the world, and as the income gaps widened by the middle of the 19th century, Europe decided it would basically go out and conquer the rest of the world because the gaps of power were so great. And the colonial age, for another hundred years, in a way enforced a lot of those gaps. Some historians, such as Neil Ferguson across the river uh, at Harvard, say empire was a great way to advance progress, and I respectfully disagree. I think it was a way actually to stop what otherwise would have been faster convergence because imperial powers were not interested in progress in their colonies. They were interested in making money and keeping political control. And those are quite different things than propelling broad-based progress. But after 1950, something very important happened. Two things. One is that for a lot of reasons, some gradual and some more rapid, the ability for technologies to diffuse widely 
to be absorbed widely had spread to much more of the world. So the chance for convergent growth was much stronger. And second, politically, the end of the imperial era, news which did not come to the White House in time, but still, the end of the imperial era was at hand. And that made possible a rapid development in a lot of the formerly controlled places in the world in higher education, in mass literacy, in development of industry, and it's set in motion with a tremendous amount of messiness, confusion, very bad missteps, violence, and all the rest. So I'm not telling a neat story, but I'm making it sound neater than it is. It made possible a shift from a period of divergent economic development to convergent economic development. And I take <coughs> India and China to be the two exemplars of that in our time. China, since the opening of the economy after Mao's death and Deng Xiaoping's coming to power in 1978, has been achieving economic growth of about 10% per year. Not because it's a miracle, <coughs> but because China's catching up technologically. It's doing a very good job of it. 10% growth is unprecedented, <coughs> especially for a region of 1.3 billion people, 22% of the world's population. But if you grow at 10%, it means you double every seven years. And they've been doing that now for 30 years, which means four doublings. So you've gone two times two times two times two, 16 times roughly the rise of per capita income. India started a little bit later. It's growing a little bit more slowly. But its 1.1 billion people are achieving economic growth now on the order of about 7% per year, which is a doubling time of a decade. And that means now for roughly the last 20 years, you've had a fourfold increase for the 1.1 billion people of India. And of course, this kind of convergent growth is taking place in other regions as well. Brazil, for example, not as fast, but in my view, very importantly, now achieving technological catching up, leadership in some key technological sectors, Embraer in uh, aviation or biofuels and so forth. And this is a sign of that kind of convergence taking hold as well. I'll come back in a moment to the absolutely critical fact that a part of the world and Sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, is largely implicated in this, is not part of that dynamic convergence yet. It could be, but there are many reasons why you can get trapped at the bottom and not be part of this and often need a bit of a help to get the convergence process going. From a global point of view, though, I think the dominant trend is not that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer but rather that the rich have been getting richer and the poor have been getting richer even faster, on average. Again, with all due acknowledgement of the fact that averages aren't so good for the people at the bottom. But <clears throat> from a global perspective, this matters because it means first that the world economy has been expanding dramatically. And in recent years at about 5% per year, which is a doubling time of 14 years. And don't think I remember all these doubling times. Just remember, divide 70 by the growth rate, and that tells you how many years it is to double. So a five-year growth rate is 70 divided by 5, or 14 years. And that's a lot of growth for an economy that is now $10,000 per person, 6.7 billion of us. That means roughly a 67 trillion dollar economy <clears throat> on path roughly to double every 15 or 20 years right now because of the continuing gradual progress of countries at the technological frontier, which has long been the propulsive force of the US economy for 200 years, 
with a 1.7% per year average growth per person, pretty much constant as long as we can measure the data. And that is a 40-year doubling time. And that's a gradual growth when you're in the technological lead. Being in the lead is hard. Keeping new inventions, new discoveries, new innovations. Starting far behind for whatever bad historical accidents and then catching up is a bit easier. Then you can have the 10% growth rather than the 1.7% growth. But quantitatively, it's staggering to consider this, how fast things are changing. Now, part of the change is quite obvious. It's geopolitical change. The idea that the United States is the unique world power was passe even before the neoconservatives made such a disaster of that fantasy. <clears throat> We're 4.7% of the world's population. The rest of the world is absorbing and developing technologies at a remarkable rate. We are not the greatest colossus since Rome. Of course, unlike, or unlike the Roman Empire, we have the capacity to fully and completely destroy the planet. Our technologies of destruction are a lot greater, but not power, which is a relative proposition. And so the whole idea of the United States as being out there all by itself was already wrong economically years ago. Now I think people are beginning to see how naive it was. <clears throat> Geopolitically, the weight of the world economy is shifting to Asia. This is now a, a, a cliché. But clichés can be both true and hugely significant because the North Atlantic has felt like it's run the world for at least the last 200 years. And that is ending. It will end. And that's fine. Good. Because it doesn't mean the collapse of well-being in the North Atlantic region, it means the ability of the rest of the world to enjoy the benefits of a scientific and technological era, which in my view is the core basis of our improved material standards, longevity, and at least that's the only part that economics can speak to. What it means for our morals and all the rest that's another complicated subject we might touch on. But in terms of staying alive uh, and having the ability to meet material needs, it's a tremendous improvement. So what's the problem? Seems to me that the problem is threefold. First, all that good news has to be put alongside the fact that it is literally unsustainable unsustainable in terms of the natural environment and the resources on which we depend. We literally cannot go on doing what we're doing even at a $67 trillion economy, much less one that will double to $134 trillion in 14 years or double again in another 20 years to a $250 trillion economy. We could not do that with our current technologies. That's an important thing to understand. And of course, we don't understand it. And we read, if you read the Wall Street Journal editorial page, we read every day that what I just said is false. That's our leading business journal in this country. What I would recommend second piece of advice, including getting to know your neighbor, uh, is do not read the Wall Street Journal editorial page for its scientific content. <laughs> it is mildly entertaining, mostly infuriating, and it happens to be sandwiched in between wonderful news pages. So read the news pages, very good newspaper. But the editorial page is fatuous, scientifically absolutely destructive systematic misinformation. Am I being clear? <laughs> and the reason is because the clear evidence is that the weight of human activity on the Earth's systems 
has reached dangerous levels which accumulate. Climate change, of course, is perhaps the biggest. It is the biggest. And it is now the most known thanks to a good public debate in the last three or four years. It's worth dwelling on that just for a moment. Climate change, of course, is caused by anthrop caused by many things, but the dominant force is anthropogenic, human-made, and it's largely due to human-made emissions of roughly six greenhouse gases, of which the most important by far is carbon dioxide. And about 80% of the carbon dioxide emissions come from burning fossil fuels, and the other 20% roughly come from cutting down tropical forests. Both of those are not sustainable because the level of our carbon dioxide emissions, thank you, the level of our carbon dioxide emissions right now has reached about 36 tr billion tons per year. And when you take into account how the carbon cycle works, some of that carbon stays in the atmosphere, some is, uh, is uh, uh, absorbed uh, in the terrestrium, some uh, in, uh, in the oceans, you find that about uh, two parts per million increase of carbon dioxide each year now is associated with the anthropogenic emissions. So the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are rising, and that's the basis of the long-term human-induced climate change. If you look at what that implies, just keeping on that level of two parts per million, that has taken us from 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in the industrial, beginning of the industrial era, to now 385 parts per million. Climate change already summarized of about 0.7 degrees centigrade. Pure inertial forces of another uh, Point, actually about 0.8 or 0.9 degrees centigrade average increase and another 0.6 or 7 degrees of pure thermal inertia, meaning that if we emitted nothing else, we'd continue to warm by about 0.6 or 7 degrees centigrade just as the oceans catch up with the warming because the oceans take longer to warm than the atmosphere and, and, uh, and the land surface. So we've already done quite a bit, but as the carbon concentrations continue to rise, of course the effects continue to increase dramatically. And if we did two parts per million for the rest of the century, adding another 180 parts per million roughly to the 385, so you'd be at 570 or so, more than twice the pre-industrial level there's virtually a consensus among the climatologists and all those scientific areas affected by climate, whether it's glaciology or it's hydrology or it's agronomy or it's infectious disease epidemiology, that that level of change would be a cascading series of disasters for key human systems and for much of the biosphere. That's our current trajectory. That's the literal sense, I mean, in which we're not sustainable at what we're doing now. That doesn't mean that we're doomed to follow that path. It just means we can't continue doing what we're doing right now. Now, in almost every area of human impact on the physical systems, you could say the same thing. It's not only greenhouse gas emissions, it's land transformation, heavily related to food demand, it's tropical deforestation, it's the depletion of almost every great ocean fishery in the world. It's a multiplication of invasive species introduced advertently or inadvertently in all parts of the world through changing farm systems or through population movements. It's incredible interventions, shocking interventions, in the hydrological cycle. We use water mainly to grow food. About 70% of water use by human societies for food production. We've dammed every river in the world anywhere close to people. 
We have about 60,000 dams now. Many of the world's major rivers no longer flow to the sea. The Ganges, the Yellow River. We have incredible unsolved problems of water in many highly populous parts of the world, of which the two most dramatic are the Ganges Plains, where you have about 250 million people living. They put down roughly 30 million bore wells in the last 30 years. And the aquifers are draining a lot faster than recharge. And the second dramatic area is the North China Plain, where you also have perhaps 200 million people, depending on local food production, with a dramatic drop of, uh, of uh, the water aquifers. Again, with uh, water abstraction far greater than recharge rates. And those hydrological problems are pervasive. Of course, they're in the US West, what we've done to the Colorado River, to the Rio Grande, to uh, building up a vast infrastructure in places now in persistent and deepening drought, the depletion of the Ogallala Reservoir in Texas and Oklahoma, the changing snowmelt, because snowpack is a kind of buffer of winter rains over mountains that then provides summer irrigation through river flow. But now those winter rains don't get into the snowpack because of temperature increases, or the snowpack melts early in the spring rather than during the summer growing months. And so there are big water crises in a lot of the mountain-derived uh, water places in the world, which is hundreds of millions of people. And of course, many of the glaciers which feed large populations are going to disappear in the next 40 or 50 years. So that's water, fisheries, land change, soil degradation, nitrogen fluxes. Because now we add more nitrogen each year to the soil than nature does. There's a natural nitrogen cycle from our 78% N2 in the atmosphere, broken up by lightning or by bacteria that can fix the nitrogen in reactive form, which can get taken up into plants, built into proteins, and then get eaten by us. And what's happening is, in order to feed 6.7 billion people, we now use massive amounts of nitrogen-based fertilizer. It's been called the most pivotal discovery of the 20th century, the Haber-Bosch process, which breaks the triple bonds of N2 to make urea-based fertilizers, because that's what fed the planet in the 20th century and what feeds the planet today. And where I see starving people, in Africa, it's typically because they don't have nitrogen at their disposal, either in their soils, which are depleted, or they can't afford the fertilizer. So it's wonderful using all this nitrogen, but we use it in such vast amounts now that we are a larger force in the nitrogen cycle than nature itself. And this is causing massive pollution, eutrophication being the main form. The dead zones in the estuaries all over the world, as rivers collect the fertilizer, concentrated into the estuaries and the entryways into the oceans, where there's tremendous marine life that we depend on. And there's massive dead zones developing all over the world. This has been well summarized, this whole connection of phenomena, by a single word that I really adore in its vividness and uh, conceptual uh, appropriateness, the Anthropocene. The idea of Paul Crutzen, the Nobel laureate, one of the three who discovered the pathways by which chlorofluorocarbons destroy the ozone level and thereby helping to save a lot of us through that discovery in the 1970s, said we're no longer in what the geologists call the Holocene, which is the post-Ice Age era. We're now in the Anthropocene, meaning, of course, in Greek, that we're in the human-made era because we're so dominant in the Earth's ecosystems that we're driving them. And we're not driving them safely. We're driving them over a cliff right now. So to me, this is the great conundrum. 
Here we have a world economy, very dynamic, very exciting that convergence is possible. It's what we're hoping for and what we're seeing. It's raising material well-being dramatically. And I want to emphasize, I believe that that economic growth is a good thing in terms of human well-being. I don't believe it's you know, false advertising, pandering things that we don't need. Of course, there's some of that. But the difference of being in poverty and not is a real difference, in my opinion. Spending a lot of time with poor people, it's no good not having communications, transport, electricity, safe drinking water, clinics, and schools, and the opportunities that those mean. And that's what poverty implies, not having those needs met. So here we have this exciting prospect where we can have this transformation, and yet we're at a time when we're already in a perilous state vis-a-vis -vis the global environment. Two more problems I would add to this. One is the population of the world continues to multiply, so it's not only absorbing rising living standards, but as I said, absorbing another two and a half billion people on the planet. That's a lot of people. By the middle of this century, if we keep on the trajectory called the medium forecast of the UN Population Division, which says we'll go from 6.7 billion to 9.2 billion by 2050. Almost all of those people are expected to be born in the poorest regions of the world, where the environmental stresses and economic agonies are by far the greatest. The paradox of human demography is that rich people have few children and poor people have lots of children. It's understandable. The children don't survive in poor areas. Therefore, parents compensate by having large numbers of children. Children work on farms, exploited in a way by their parents, actually, because that runs the farms, but it condemns the children to a next generation of poverty, being six or seven children in an impoverished family. But it may make sense from a parent's calculation. Or there's no family planning available, no clinic, no contraception. Or women are not empowered enough to say that they want to stop having children. So there could be disagreements within the households. Or girls are not allowed to go to school or empowered to go to school. So at age 12, they're already out of school. And at age 14, they're married and starting to have children. So there are many reasons why poor people have very high fertility rates. Not one of them is good for their economic development, for the sustainability, or for the global security. But that's where we are. So that's a second challenge, in my view. The third is the irony that with all of this capacity for technological catching up, there are places in the world trapped in extreme poverty. Generally, if you have nothing, what does it mean to have nothing? Let me say literally what it means. It means you're in a village. Your shelter is an adobe hut uh, reinforced by sticks or twigs. The roof is thatch. Your planting equipment is a stick, a hoe. Your seeds are the seeds from the last year. You do not have fertilizer. You do not have high-yield seeds. You don't have small-scale water management, like even a treadle pump or a tarpaulin for a farm pond. The nearest clinic is 10 or 15 kilometers away. If you do get sick, you may not be able to afford the dollar that would be charged, or the $2 for the anti-malaria medicine, because you have no income. Your soil has no nitrogen left, or no nitrogen sufficient to deliver a decent crop, because you've been planting that same land now for 20 harvests in a row. Whereas your grandfather, or grandmother, I should say, used to rotate the farm in a large area 
but in two generations it's been subdivided so there's no more fallow land. You have your half hectare, one acre or so, and that's what you farm, and you farm it year in and year out. The rains are failing more frequently than before. Of course, you have no piped irrigation. And the rains are failing for reasons you can't understand, but probably have something to do with 385 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the aerosols of pollutants from Europe, which have pushed down the intertropical convergence zone and therefore made the Sahel about 35% drier than it used to be. So that's what absolute poverty is. Now, how do you get out of that poverty? You save? Well, you don't have saving because you don't even have enough food for two meals a day reliably. What can you save? You have to deplete or dissave to stay alive. You're depleting your soils. You're depleting the ponds nearby of the fish. You may be cutting down the trees for fuel wood. If you've not run out of trees, in which case you may be using some dung for fuel instead of replenishing the dung in the soil for at least a little bit of nutrient depletion. But even the dung in these areas of the animals is nutrient scarce because animals fed on straw and, uh, and uh, residues that are nutrient depleted are themselves nutrient depleted because the nutrient cycle isn't replenishing the nutrients by itself. That's what absolute poverty is. There are books that say, well, go make business at the bottom of the pyramid. Those are good books, but not for the bottom of the pyramid. For poor villages with income. But what I've just described is a place without income. Maybe the only income is that some of the young men have left in seasonal work. They've gone to a city. Maybe they're able to send a little bit of remittance income home. Maybe they send the AIDS virus home also. There is no business there. They're just poor people dying. So that's another part of this global scene, which we also don't care to look at very clearly. Now, I was very gratified last week when President Bush gave his national address on the environmental, demographic, and poverty crisis. You all saw that, right? Oh, he didn't give that. Yeah, <laughs> forgot. Yeah, we've not heard a word about this from the national leadership for seven years. We are just flying ahead. And we can't do that anymore. That's really the stunning fact. We liter it literally doesn't add up. And when things don't add up, they do stop. But the question is how? And as I see it in my mind's eye, we're driving fast towards a cliff. And the interesting thing, and that's really what the book goes on to say, because I'm not a pessimist by nature at all. I try to be, what, and I try to aspire to be, a problem solver. For me, the greater paradox of all of this is that all of those problems that I've discussed are solvable, in my view. And that, in fact, the image that I really have in my mind is we're driving towards a cliff, but the, the road gently turns away from the cliff. But Dick Cheney's driving the car. <laughs> and that's a problem. Because he's looking backwards, arguing with someone in the back seat, rather than thinking about where we're going. And so we're not taking the basic steps to get this right. Now, it seems to me that to get this right, we have to understand and unpack each of the problems and then understand what can be done. And I tend to think of this in engineering terms even more than economics terms. 
because I do believe so much of our lives are basically bound by how we mobilize technologies. Of course, markets can be key in mobilizing technologies or in giving the incentives for technological change. I don't want to deny that. But I think a starting point for thinking about the physical world is the physical systems, not the social systems. So I want to start by thinking about the physical systems and then think about how social systems can support the kinds of transformations of technology that we need to make these pieces add up and to do it in a way which meet our other aspirations of human freedom, democracy, and other things so that we don't try to come up with solutions which are completely contrary to other basic values, goals, or methods of social organization. So, Hmm? Yeah, let me, so let me summarize and then, uh, and then turn it for discussion. This can go on for a while, sorry. <laughs> let me say the following. If we think about the physical systems, in every case, whether it's the energy use or the water use or the food production, certainly whether it's the voluntary fertility reduction, or the ways for impoverished smallholders to escape from poverty, malaria, measles. We have either powerful existing technologies that have not been deployed properly because the systems don't give the right incentive for their deployment, because poor people don't create a market, because the global commons is mispriced, or we have technological possibilities within reach which could be deployed in an orderly way to address these challenges. With the latter where we need to develop technologies, whether it's carbon capture and sequestration so we can use the fossil fuels safely, or whether it's solar thermal energy which has a tremendous possibility for vastly multiplying our access to low and safe energy, low cost and safe energy, we need technological change and development, demonstration and diffusion of technologies which are not yet existent. And then comes the question, when we understand what could be done in a physical engineering sense, and when we understand why it's not being done right now in an incentive sense, because who's watching the global commons, or who's caring for the poorest of the poor, or who's creating the right kind of incentive structures for new technological development and demonstration, I believe we can then problem solve, both at a technical level and at an institutional level, so that we can address these key areas. It doesn't mean changing everything in our societies. It means finding ways to have sustainable energy. It means finding ways to produce food productively without ripping down the remaining rainforests or adopting technologies of aquaculture so that we don't destroy the oceans. It involves diffusing proven methods of family planning, contraception, and uh, inducing voluntary reductions of fertility, including having girls enabled to stay in school, so that the population problems can be addressed, and so forth. I'll tell you a simple couple of numbers to illustrate what we're not doing, and then I'll conclude. We are investing $700 billion this year in the military and about $200 billion a year for the Iraq War. And we're only getting steeply negative returns because these problems cannot be solved by war and our energy needs, despite Mr. Cheney's idea, cannot be secured by, or Mr. McCain's idea, cannot be secured by stationing troops for a hundred years in the Middle East. Can't work, won't work. 
not enough energy, not enough political power, no legitimacy. It's a non-starter, or it should have been a non-starter. It's a starter that's got to stop now. On the other side, how much are we investing in sustainable energy? Well, in 2006, the most recent year of data, we spent $3 billion on all our federal research and development of sustainable energy. We spent less than $300 million on renewable energies. About $70, billion, $70 million, sorry, that's one hour of Pentagon spending on carbon capture and sequestration. So we're not investing at all in these things. Total, we spent $5 billion in aid to Africa, much of which was spent here on us, on consultants, rather than on real help on the ground. Roughly two and a half days of Pentagon spending. We spent $200 million roughly on helping to fight malaria, and that is about three hours of Pentagon spending. You get the idea. Every sleeping site in Africa could be protected for five years with an anti-malaria bed net for less than one day's Pentagon spending. So we're not thinking and we're not finding approaches to actually solve these problems. Do I have five more minutes? No. Okay. Absolutely. The, uh, the only question is, thing is if somebody has to make a class, because we did schedule this for certain time, don't feel so bad about getting up and going to your class. I don't want to. We'll take your names on the way out. Because <laughs> you obviously don't the care other hand, about the planet. <laughs> If it's not an economics class, you really should stay. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. So it seems to me we could advise the next president on a few steps to take. And let me give a few suggestions of what we might send to the next president for the first day of work. Number one, get out of, the, get out of Iraq. End the war immediately. And let's put in the ledger what we're saving. Lives, ours and Iraqis, and about $200 billion a year. Second, end the Bush tax cuts. $250 billion a year. Three, let's start using a little of it. Let's raise from three to $30 billion a year the funding for sustainable technologies. I'd like to recommend a National Institute of Sustainable Technologies, like a National Institute of Health, or National Institutes <laughs> of Health. Because we have a lot of work to do. We need to promote the basic sciences and the links to industry and academia. And there's a very powerful role for the public sector to be providing a lot of the core financing of these steps. And you can see that the price is small. Four, I would immediately send an envoy on climate change to all the main capitals of the world, to Beijing, to Delhi, to the EC headquarters in Brussels, to Moscow, Tokyo, Ottawa, Canberra, to say the United States is back at the negotiating table and at least this new president recognizes what the last one didn't, which is that there was a president named George Bush Sr. who signed the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's the United States law of the land to be committed to stabilizing greenhouse gases. That's what we agreed to do in 1992. But we have not acted on the law of the land, even though we're treaty bound. And the next president can say we're back at the table. And by the end of 2009, we should be signing an agreement in Copenhagen when the conference of the parties of this framework convention meet. 
to get to an agreement post Kyoto. It's going to be a lot of work in 2009, but it's crucial that we make the bridge from Kyoto. Next, I would say that the president should assert that not only in the area of the global commons of the atmosphere and climate, but also in the global commons of biodiversity and the sea, that we will become parties to international law, meaning signing the Convention on Biological Diversity, which the United States has never ratified, and signing the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which again the United States has never ratified. We stand outside of international law, and we need to be part of it. And moreover, I would recommend to the president, I'm sure the next president will know what this one did not, which is that international treaties are national law under the Constitution. And that also means the Geneva Conventions. So we should... <laughs> we should stop torture, otherwise known in the New York Times now as extreme interrogation. Now, there's a, a term that our media play along with to twist our minds. We should stop torture. It's against the law, also for presidents of the United States. Very simple. We should stop our assault on family planning by starting to fund, once again, the United Nations Population Fund, which was cut off to, as a sop to the religious right, or at least that was how it was seen, and thereby worsening poverty and global security by making it impossible for the poorest of the poor to have access to contraceptive services, family planning services, emergency obstetrical care, and other sexual and reproductive health services. And the United States should not only fund this effort, but should once again be an active partner in this effort. We should do at least two more things. One is to make the Millennium Development Goals the world's global objectives, part of our objectives as well. Here's the odd thing. As far as I know, President Bush has said the words Millennium Development Goals in sequence once in seven years. I, I was there, September 14, 2005. He said it at the United Nations, never before, and as far as I know, never thereafter. And yet these are the world's leading, shared, committed objectives to fight poverty, disease, and hunger. And finally, I think what we need to do urgently is give our government eyesight again, because we're flying blind, we're driving blind. And we don't even have the capacity institutionally in Washington to understand what's happening. You see, our aid agency was gutted and politicized years ago, USAID. It hardly exists as a thinking institution. The Defense Department has taken over a large part of what's called our development aid. That is money through Halliburton and other wondrous development projects in Iraq. We've deprofessionalized the government so that there's not the capacity to understand climate change, water stress, hunger abroad, agronomic possibilities, exactly the things that we're hitting against today. I compare us a little bit to one of our intest one intestinal parasite, which whose whole life cycle essentially after the larva stage is clinging to the inside gut of the intestine and sucking out blood. And it's dark in the intestine. So over time, this worm has actually evolved to lose its eyes. And that's how I think of Washington somehow. <laughs> uh, that, uh, I don't know, they're sucking out something uh, from the, the side of the gut and they don't see anymore. So what we need is a cabinet level department for international sustainable development that brings together 
that brings together professionals in agronomy, hydrology, in climatology, even in economics, I think would be a good idea. And in, the, in other areas of vital concern for achieving sustainability on the planet. Now, I do want to close because I really think it important. Uh, I know you think it important that I close also. <laughs> but I want to close with a few words, uh, not of mine, but of uh, President John F. Kennedy. Because we've had a little debate in this country in the last few months whether words matter. And I think words matter a lot. And I think uh, words can convey uh, meaning of life-saving importance. And I know from my favorite speech of a modern American president, which is John F. Kennedy's speech on peace in uh, American University commencement in June 1963, that the words mattered a lot because they were so beautiful and so powerful that when Nikita Khrushchev heard them in the Soviet Union, he immediately called the US envoy and said, I want to sign a treaty with President Kennedy. He said those are the finest words uttered by an American president in the last uh, decades since FDR, is what Khrushchev said. And what came out of that speech was the uh, Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But the importance of the speech was President Kennedy telling the American people, don't believe it's impossible to do great things, including making peace. And don't think that we are inevitably doomed to disaster. And don't think that our adversaries are irrevocably and inevitably committed to our destruction. We have common interests on the planet. And since what we need more than anything else is a sense of our common interests and working together, I find that these remarks, do we have a book? Yeah. yeah. Uh, these remarks resonate across two generations and are extraordinarily important and powerful for us to understand. So let me just close by reading to you an excerpt from this marvelous speech, which, by the way, is uh, online and is magnificent to listen to. Too many of us think that peace is impossible. Too many think it unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. We need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. And man can be as big as he wants. No problem of human destiny is beyond human control. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly impossible and we believe they can do it again. I am not referring to the absolute infinite concept of universal peace and goodwill of which some fantasies and fanatics dream. I do not deny the value of hopes and dreams, but we merely invite discouragement and incredulity by making that our only and immediate goal. Let us focus instead on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a revolution of human nature but on an evolution of human institutions, on a series of concrete actions and effective agreements which are in the interest of all concerned. There is no single simple key to this piece, no grand or magic formula to be adopted by one or two powers. Genuine peace must be the product of many nations, the sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static, changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. And ours is sustainable development. For peace is a process, a way of solving problems. And then President Kennedy said something of incredible beauty and I think summing this message. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and to the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link 
is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. Thank you very much. about thank you so much uh, for coming and uh, for being so patient patient <laughs> and for uh, for sharing Jeff's uh, Jeff's vision as you obviously do for those of you who would like to stay for just a few minutes to ask some questions we have I have to get Jeff over to another engagement so we have about eight minutes to do that <laughs> so if we could uh, have a couple questions Jeff, go ahead. Please, uh, just to speak up. Yeah, you have to stand up and speak up. Um, how exactly do you feel about the like pros and cons of carbon sequestration? Yeah. Like, so the question is, how do I feel about the pros and cons of carbon sequestration? I feel that we better find out whether it can work. And what that means is that we're at a stage where we have good blueprints, a lot of engineering, but not one single demonstration project. And yet, China is building, as we're often told, the equivalent of at least one coal-fired power plant every week without capturing and sequestering its carbon. So if this technology works, it's transformative. If it doesn't work, we're in a lot of trouble, frankly. So we need to find out with technologies like that whether they are feasible, how costly, how safe, uh, what kind of public acceptability? There are a lot of geological and other questions. My uh, colleagues in engineering are very optimistic about this technology and in geology, but they also want to see it tested. So one of the things I would like that climate on, envoy to say on his uh, or her first trip around the world is that we're ready to help fund out of our new ins National Institutes of Sustainable Technology we're ready to help fund demonstration plants in India and China to, and in the US to see whether this technology is feasible. In general, with big technologies, let's not rule out whole classes of technology. Same with agrobiotechnology. Don't rule them out. We have to be specific because these are powerful instruments that can do a lot of good if they can be proven to be effective for specific tasks. Please. Um, so you mentioned that the problem in Africa and I believe in other developing worlds is with um, poor soil content. And I'm wondering if that can be fixed uh, either with uh, regional fertilizer production and or importing with USAID sterilized soil that you would then add bone meal and kelp meal and other uh, organic fertilizing yeah. additives. So the, the, uh, the, the problems uh, in general, most fertilizers, I mean most soils need, uh, all soils uh, need uh, nitrogen replenishment regularly and many need other kinds of nutrients to be replenished as well. In the tropical oxisols, which is the soil type in most of Africa, the Organic matter is very rapidly weathered, easily depleted, easily leached, and not uh, naturally uh, regenerated uh, except by very, very long fallow periods, which are no longer feasible. So nitrogen is urgently needed. All of the agronomy that I know suggests you need a mix of organic and inorganic nitrogens to replenish. There's nothing wrong with the soil structure per se. You don't have to bring in new soils. The soil can be adequate for planting if the nutrients are replenished and other needs are met. And one of the things we've done in the last couple of years is work with the government of Malawi to create a voucher scheme so that every impoverished household gets one bag of nitrogen-based fertilizer 
and one bag of high yield seeds. That's conventionally uh, bread seeds, but hybrid maize seeds. And on that basis, in the last three harvests in a row now, Malawi has more than doubled its food production compared to the baseline, compared to the uh, crisis years in the past. And th this shows, this is what is sometimes called the Green Revolution. And this could happen across Africa at very low cost. It turns out it would be something like $100 uh, a, a household to do this at the start, which is maybe $20 per capita. And the total costs are at least uh, roughly a tenth of what it would cost to send food aid, for example, which admittedly we don't send. We just leave people to go extremely hungry. And there isn't food aid anymore because we've put it in our gas tank. Uh, we're putting one third of our corn production this year into the gas tank, which is one of the factors driving up the food prices to begin with. So what I'm recommending is a practical plan to help poor people get the basic inputs they need so they can grow more of a crop, become commercial farmers, start microfinance and micro saving, and thereby be able to take this on on their own after a few years. It's just to get it started. Please. So the, the question is how I feel about s social cash transfers like the Bolsa Familia in Brazil or like Progressa in Mexico. Those are, I think, effective programs for countries at three or four or five thousand dollars per capita. Because what they say is if you take your child to a clinic, then you can get the bonus. But in the places I'm talking about, there's no clinic. So in order to get started, it's not a matter of giving money. It's a matter of building basic infrastructure. And so this cash transfer program shouldn't be confused. It works in certain settings, but it doesn't work for the poorest of the poor. What's needed there is actual investment, basic infrastructure, basic agriculture, clinics, schools, health services. And then incomes can rise, and then this kind of it can, the help can be converted in fact, or even self-financed to this kind of cash transfer. But it's not, Brazil is at, uh, oh, at this point, five, $6,000 per capita, uh, probably. Uh, and uh, in Malawi, it's $200 per capita. Not at that purchasing adjusted rate, but at the market exchange rates. And that shows why it's a, com a very different setting. Maybe one more. One more quick question. In the back, yeah. Please, yeah. Okay, two. <laughs> For, yeah, that's okay. Go on. Um, I was really inspired by your list of presidential recommendations, but I also wonder if you could give us a quick part two of, for those of us who are in this room, um, to welcome to the White House soon, um, but are <coughs> mobilized and passionate. Well, first, help someone get to the White House that's going to do the right thing. <laughs> Very important for the campuses. I think the campuses can elect the next president. Uh, and I think that, uh, that political action is very, very important because this is the time to get our country turned in a direction that is meaningful for the future. So that's, I think, very important for you. Second, it seems to me that universities play a unique role in this. Uh, there's a superb program on global public health at BU and many other superb programs. Get involved in these and push the university to be out there in problem solving. There's a debate about how far out a university should be in problem solving. My view is way out there. And the reason is that I believe, in addition to the fact that universities have something unique to offer, crucial, which is integrated systematic knowledge in many disciplines and an unbiasedness and a long-term view and a lot of energy of uh, people that want to solve global problems. All of that, uh, I think, uh, makes the university crucial. I'll add one more thing. I don't think you can understand these issues without being engaged in the problem solving. They're too complex. The issues are not the things that are under the microscope. Those are vital. But what I'm talking about are integrated 
problem solving in the world that involve political, economic, ecological, physical systems. They're enormous, and cultural systems and social understanding. And these are enormously complex. We can't even teach them properly without being there engaged. And so purely from a point of view of research, because I, I used to be told, not so much anymore, but well, that's all fine and good, Jeff. That's nice, but you know, do please come back and do your research. And this is my research because it's extremely crucial for clarity of understanding the problems to say what would it take to solve them. And then you say, oh, yes, I didn't realize that strand is really decisive. So for good classroom instruction, good research, and because of the unique capacity of universities to add real value to problem solving, I want the universities to be way out there. We have also programs, uh, we call it the Millennium Villages program, where we're learning a phenomenal amount, working in villages around the world now, mainly in Africa. And uh, I very much welcome volunteers, people that are interested, and so forth. And my email is sachs at columbia.edu. Uh, I have okay. a question. Sir, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, you mentioned uh, three different things, uh, mentioned natural resources, uh, the climate, and um, population, population, natural resources, and extreme right. poverty. Yeah. I think human capital in the sense of <laughs> healthy, uh, well-educated, and skilled people will never be a constraint. Uh, and uh, India is adding a lot of uh, human capital for the whole world right now. But I don't think India really needs to go up to 1.6 billion people uh, to do this. India is about 16% uh, of the world's population right now. Uh, and uh, it's roughly about 2% of the world's land area. And the water scarcity is phenomenal. And all the reasons I mentioned in the Gangetic uh, Valley and uh, Gangetic Plains uh, and the Himalayan water systems and all the rest add great fragility uh, right now for India. Uh, so India is, has a total fertility rate of about uh, 2.9, I think, which is still far above replacement. There's too much population growth. It should be a concern uh, for uh, slowing the population growth, getting the, the fertility rate voluntarily down to replacement levels uh, quickly. Uh, there are big investments going on in human capital in India, obviously in education, but also in health now, which is extremely exciting. Uh, something called the National Rural Health Mission I'm very excited about. Um, so I think population limitation, but India and China are absolutely in the front line of risk from uh, all of these environmental stresses because these are the most crowded places in the world. Uh, and uh, China, 22% of the world's population, 6% of the freshwater resources. Uh, and India, similarly. So I hope that India and China, with the great science that's being developed, will also be developing sustainable technologies and be leaders in that area as well. Thanks.